the whole album at your house? Yeah, we did. That's we, not, you're still married? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my and my kids are still <laughs> pitter pattering across the microphones. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I tell people all the time: if you get in a real studio and kind of dissect it, you're going to hear doors slamming, phones ringing, alarms going off, and kids running around screaming everywhere. <laughs> it's cool, but it's always now. I can't just relieve myself of it because there's nothing like. 11 o'clock at night, I'm going, God, I, got, I want to go sing that thing again. Yeah. And just run downstairs, you know. And sing it. Yeah, I got a theater down there, and I just leave everything turned on, everything set up. Same. You know, it takes me two seconds to get my mic hot again. Yeah. And I'm not the greatest singer in the world, but you know how it is, man. You go in the studio some days, for whatever reason, it's not working. You got all these people around, so you got to try and make it work. Yeah, man. And you just, it's, that that can be a real stressful day, right? Yeah, there's just too much, there's just too much racket, in my opinion, with when you, I don't like schedules. And so when you have to <laughs> book stuff, it's like my schedule, as you well know, is busy enough and we're out of town all the time. So when I'm home, I don't want to have a schedule. I just kind of want to be normalized. And so I was in the writing mode. I was writing a bunch of songs for this thing. And again, I, I, we had no derivative plans of, of having an album at the time. I was just writing good songs because Drunk Girl was having success and we just won the ACM and stuff. And I was in a good headspace. So I was writing a lot of new songs and we would just do the work tape and then we just start recording it and putting the music down to it. And then we would have, you know, just a glorified demo basically. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all came together, to be honest with you. And I know a lot of people don't really understand this process. I think the average American has this vision, which is the case a lot of times. I'm going in a big studio, a lot of musicians sitting around with sheets of paper in front yeah. of them and working it out. And yeah. a lot of records are made that way, obviously. Yeah. But there's also this writing process that goes on now with what are called track guys, where you sit down and you got somebody basically building a record on a computer, for lack of a better way of putting it. What it is. And then some good lyricists, guys that have written a lot of songs, and not that track guys aren't. Right. But... But sometimes that's what they're really focusing on. Yeah. And then you start that process where you're just popping over their shoulder and coming up with lines and Words. stuff. Yeah. 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 It's a trippy thing, man. Some of the some of my record was made a little bit that way. Not a lot mm -hmm. because, you know, my co-producer on this record is an actual songwriter. He just happens to be really <laughs> good on a computer. But mm -hmm. but it but but I don't really follow. I, I kind of go the old school way of writing just because I appreciate how the method is done and. And I'm an old school writer. I mean, my heart's just in it that way. Yeah. I look up to guys, you know, like Curly and the rest of them. Right. Like guys that I used to pass when I was walking into Sony ATV back when it was when you could still smoke in the fire hall. <laughs> that's when I was going in there and writing. And, yeah. and I just that's the kind of songwriting I love. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote, you know, the majority of this record like that. But the great thing about it is, you know, it's titled the title is Real Friends. And not only did I make it with real friends, including the songwriting community and the you know, everybody community, but mm -hmm. there are kids on this record who've never had a cut before. And, you know, there's a lot of first chances on this cool. record. The drummer on the album has never played on a major album. Um, a lot of the parts, I've never produced an album. I never co-produced an album and my co-producers never produced an album. So there were a lot of firsts for us. And it, and for whatever reason, God has blessed it, man, because it feels, it feels like the best yet. I think it's just because it was a natural fit all mm -hmm. the way around. And I never really had to leave my own common space to do it you know i have a room just a lot like where we're sitting here today mm -hmm. this is surrounded by things that i love and enjoy mm -hmm. it makes me really comfortable and um there's just something to be said about that and getting up at 11 o'clock at night like you said to fix a vocal <laughs> or to sing a vocal the way you really want to do it yeah. or you may just want to do it totally different and we did a lot of that in fact we were going through videos the other night on our phones kind of laughing like Oh my gosh, this is the first pass on <laughs> Done, which is going to be the new single after Good uh -huh. Vibes, but this is the this is the first pass we did and we we would video me singing it to really capture that moment and um and if we had to go back and fix something, we want to do it like this, you know. So So that all brings up a lot of questions for me. Yes. First one is you say you're an old school writer and I don't mean you say it like you're not because I know you are. But for me, even Way back when, when I first started writing songs here, occasionally somebody would bring in a drum machine just to get a rhythm going or beat or something. Yeah. And I'm always like, could we please turn that off for a second? Yeah. I mean, I can't freaking think. Yeah. You know, it's like I, I love a guitar in my lap and just sitting with somebody and talking it over and working it out. And then if we want to make this up tempo, 
If it's if the Let's lyrics that good and we've got a good up tempo song, now what if we put a groove on it like this yeah. or something? But so I'm just going to go back and question a little bit because this this process does really interest me because I I know a little bit about all the stuff you can play because I've seen you do it. Yeah. <laughs> so so, but you say you only wrote a most of the songs you wrote with that kind of process. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So then how did you go to Wait, recording? Uh, let me let me reverse that. Right. A handful of songs we wrote. What, what process do you mean? Just I mean the, the process the, of having like a, a track guy and building things because oh, you no. said a lot of them are kind yeah. of glorified demos. They, so. they are. They are. What let do me, you mean let by me, that? Let me clarify that. Okay. So we wrote a lot of them just on guitars uh -huh. and just played the songs like okay. a normal, what I would call old sitting old regime writing. song. Yep, sitting and writing, <laughs> just making it up, right? Okay, right. But then, you know, we would always have some kind of digital around so we could actually get it going. Uh -huh. And so we can build a track when we're done to go, okay, this is what we want it to sound like. And then we just start calling all our musician friends and gotcha, saying, hey, let's do gotcha. this and that. But so we, we recorded actually kind of, frankly, in the old school way too. Yeah. We just didn't go to a select studio to do it. We just gotcha. made my house the studio. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really great because... I mean, I'm with you, man. There is a, such a natural thing about having a bunch of old vintage Gibsons around and being able to, and for me, a gut string. But um, like I wrote all my songs on a $25 pawn shop guitar, but that we just sit there and just kind of pick them up. And I'm a drummer first. So a lot of my beatboxing, if you will, or making a track or the, or the tempo or setting the template for it comes from me going boom, ch -boom, ch -boom, ch -boom, mm -hmm. on the guitar. And that's a lot like, uh, for instance, there's a song on the record called Say About Me. And it was kind of an ode to I wanted to write something in between the Migos rap group and Hank Jr. 83 ish, <laughs> which is bizarre. Bizarre. No, that makes sense. But, but we use nothing. We use nothing to make that except a guitar in my hand. And we just beat it like that and just did it. And um, and it was a lot of fun. People throw rocks at the at the word rap or hip hop, but it's everywhere yeah. in our in our genre now. Yeah. And I always defend that by saying, you know, when. When I was really starting to get serious about music, it was it was bands like the Almond Brothers and Leon Russell mm -hmm. and and that whole Tulsa crowd and the Austin crowd who were really inspiring me, probably more so than the big strings and what Chet was cutting here, as much as I love and worship Chet Atkins. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying. That totally and, do. And I know because that's what when I was in college and first putting bands together that could actually make some real money. Yeah. Um we played everything, you know, we were inspired by everything, but Same. you're also playing at frat houses sometimes, and they're playing every kind of rock, Rolling Stones at the time, you know, and, and whatever was going on, along with Hank Williams to make your ears bleed. So yeah. I know I, I wasn't in college 10 years ago, but I know this, what they're listening to is every kind of hip hop, rap, yeah. whatever somebody throws on the table, it gets the party rocking. Yeah, exactly. And it's only makes sense that's going on in Georgia and those writers are coming out of there full of it with their writing country songs. But you'd have to be deaf not to have been inspired by that party. A lot of the you greatest. know, you watch people having fun, and you're like, "I'm writing some of that, and what I'm writing." You I know? don't, yeah, I don't ever have a problem with, it, especially cross pollinating stuff, because a song's a song's a song, no matter what. All we really want as songwriters, as you well know, and as artists, is want to have a hit. So, that's just it. <laughs> I mean, however we got to get the hit, why wouldn't we do that? Yeah. And so, like for instance, when we were writing that song in particular, I said those two artists. I, I mentioned Hank Jr. and I mentioned the Migos, and my co-writers, my clevers are like. That'll never work, man. And I said, you just got to follow me. What, what's the worst that could happen? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. So let's just play it. And um, we did. And and so the coolest about it is I believe that if you speak things, man, and you really believe it in your heart, it can really come true. You know, if you just, sure. you just had to speak it. And I spoke those two artists' Sounds names. Sounds fun anyway. Yeah. I don't know what was wrong with them that day. That's right. So I, that's, I'm a I'm a sound. <laughs> they need fun another cup of, guy, of coffee. Right? That's what I'm saying. I'm like, I'm already cranked up on three, four Mountain Dews that morning and, and enjoying a really nice Padron cigar. So I'm, I'm in a great mood already. And and so I spoke those names and then, you know, we get down the pike a little bit and I was playing it for the record label and of course they loved it and it was it was a it was a gonna go on the album, you know, part of the process. And I said, you know, um, we were talking about doing a collaboration, which I'm not a huge collaboration-y guy because uh -huh. I've always prided in being my own person and my own thing, and I never want to lean on somebody else to try to get it done. But um, when they when they brought up maybe a collaboration on the song Say About Me, I was like, well, I'll, 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 tr I'll entertain it if we can go to the Migos. 
Uh-huh. You know, and uh, and so everybody was like, ah, that'll probably never happen. But it turns out uh, me and Offset from the Migos, uh, we did a collaboration on this song. And then fast forward, I was in Los Angeles with my wife, and we were heading to the airplane to, to fly out to the show. And we stopped to get some burgers, and we walked into this little burger joint in, in Hollywood, and the only people in line were me and Offset. <laughs> yeah, so that, if that ain't God, I don't know what is. So he puts you together with people like that. You know, it's not just happenstance. And uh -huh. we walked in, and I introduced We never met in person. I introduced myself, and when I did, he was like, oh, my God, Chris Jansen, say about me. I love the song. <laughs> And, and now seeing you, I know wow. it's real. And wow. um, yeah, so it was really cool how that kind of connected. So it's my first time kind of stepping out of genre and out of my wheelhouse and out of my comfort zone, most uh -huh. importantly, to do something that's that's totally, you know, a little bit off record, but it's it just fit for some reason. The great thing about each of our artistry is, number one, we, we, we kind of... We kind of are built the same way. We like the same size clothes. We we love we like cool cars. We like cool jewelry and and things like that. And, but we're really we're both fathers of four. We we have a wow. lot in common as far as loving our families and putting that first. And then secondly, a lot of their way that they go to the drawing board is a lot like we go to the drawing board. They just do it in a different style in a mm -hmm. different town, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, but we but we both come from the bottom and that and that rising to the top is a is a dream big win big kind of mantra. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it worked. And, um, you know, I have two collaborations on the record, that one and then the title track with Blake Shelton, Real Friends. And um, again, that, that was just a, a song that I wrote that I wanted to pitch to Blake as a songwriter. And I knew that would probably not happen because it was I knew it was really good. And I knew that my label would want me to keep it for myself, which I'm cool with. And I thought, <laughs> well, I'll just see if he wants to do a, a collaboration on it. So he did. And um, it turned out really good. But the whole the whole album in full. It was just a really big blessing because the songs came so naturally. And I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, you you came up as a songwriter as well. And, and I think a lot of it has to just do with the headspace that you're in and just feeling good in your heart. And, you know, like I said, we were coming off of the great success of the of the ballad. And I just was in a good mood and I started writing all these songs. I probably wrote 30 songs for the album and picked 13. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it was really it was really a not real a thought about process. It just kind of happened. And um when we decided we would make an album, I said, man, I really, I really want it to be in 2019. And they were like, well, yeah, how's about October? So if you can get it turned in by this date, no pressure, that's great. And uh, we'll see what happens. So we went to the drawing board and got to work. I don't know about you. For me, if I don't have something to write for, if I don't have a project or something, most songwriters in general, are, I think, are pretty lazy. Yeah. I mean, I think as a, as a troop, we kind of, um, like to screw off. We like to hunt, and fish, yeah. and play golf. Oh boy, me too. And, <laughs> but also, <clears throat> you know, there's always what I call the green fly syndrome, where there's always something buzzing around back there, going, "Hey, you might want to write a song. Yeah, that's hey, a cool wanna, idea. I want to keep your job you going. Wanna, <laughs> <laughs> you might want to go chase that one. Yeah. I like what she just said. Yeah, somebody's <laughs> got to pay for the hunt. Um, no, I'm with you, like. I have to, I'm a schedule regimented person when it comes to writing songs. And that's about the only time scheduling I like to have. I know that contradicts exactly what I said in the very <laughs> beginning of the conversation. But what I mean by that is, let me, let me be clear when I say that I like having a 10 to 2 writing schedule. When I first started co-writing in Nashville, that's what everybody was doing. And I was like, well, that is weird. Like who can start at 10 o'clock like a job and go in and write songs? I was doing it for I was doing it for artsy reasons back mm -hmm. then. Then I started I started understanding that people like Dean Dillon were making a full-time living doing it. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow, God, like, <laughs> oh my God. So I remember if Dean thinking, can get up in the morning. No, for I real. Sure as hell That's can. right. So I started thinking, <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna try it. And when I got in, you know, before before the big artist success came and I was having success as a writer first. I remember getting into that regimen, and I still love that because mm -hmm. everything before whatever time I start, I'm being a normal whatever I want to mm -hmm. do, hunting, fishing, raising kids, you know, whatever. But then in that time of writing songs, I'm writing songs and that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I know that if I, it, whether I have something around that one or two o'clock mark or not, I'm usually pretty much done at that point. Yeah. My brain is already there and, you know, I'm already wanting to do something else. Yeah. And uh, that's how I made this whole album. I, I regimented that part of it, which keeps me in line and keeps me kind of motivated to do Makes you feel good too. It does make me feel good. It relieves you instead of feeling Correct. like you've got a you've got a final exam coming up and you haven't studied. For that's it. right. That's right. That's and a so, bad feeling. Yeah. So I kind of scheduled my I scheduled my work day and then everything around that was just easy going. And I don't consider the 
I've never really considered the studio process a work day unless I had to drive there. <laughs> and I didn't have to drive there, so it was uh, it just worked out. I've seen you. It's interesting because you talked about your drummer never played on a album before yeah. or earlier, and and I've seen you uh, play drums, hit cymbals with your knees together, uh, harmonica and guitar all at the same time. Yeah, you mentioned you're a drummer first, and I believe that you you play good drums. So thank you. How did you pick him? You are co-producing. What made you go? Because you got to know what a good drummer is. Uh, what, where'd that decision come from? I'm just a little curious. Sure. Well, first, first thing I always think is, thank you for the compliment, but first thing I always, uh, go to is, and remember is there's always somebody better than you at what you're doing. And so, yeah, I feel like I'm a good drummer, but there are great drummers and I'm not a good, I thought I could play guitar when I got to Nashville. See, I'm not a guy who can play, (laughs) I'm not a guy who can play to a click. I can't play to a meter or a tempo Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, studio, there are some guys who are just built for the studio playing. And so how I found him was I was going through a Rolodex of who I thought would be a great drummer for the project. And there's a gazillion great drummers in Nashville. And a lot of them I'm really close with and they've done a lot of work with me. But my co-producer, Tommy, was like, man, I got this guy. We, when we were in the demo phase, mm-hmm. he's like, he'll give us a great deal on the demos. He's really amazing and he needs the work. And I'm a big champion of people who need sure. the work. Like if I'm able to ble- to with my blessings that I've incurred in turn to bless someone else in any way, shape or form, that's the first thing that I run to. And so I said, well, let's use him. Let's try that. So he called this guy and we sent him a couple songs. He played them right then and had them back to us. And I was like, oh my God, that's exactly the drummer. And so, you know, we'd get four five, six songs down the road and then he'd be out of town and we'd hire another drummer because we were in the song process. I'd get the, I'd get the little, the drum track back. I didn't like it. I'd wait for that drummer to get back in town. He'd get the gig. He played the whole album, and he did a really good job. And um, I don't know. It's and again, it's another first mm-hmm. for somebody, you know. And so, the, those blessings really kind of spirit too. Yeah, honestly, good spirit. Yeah, good spirit. And it also kind of just infiltrated itself through this whole album. And so, the real friends has more of a meaning than just me and my real buddies. You know, it has a real it has a real spirit to it in the fact that real friends were made, real relationships were made. And real lives were changed in this album, and it's giving you know it's giving people a first shot that may have you know the, I got a f- one phone call that really meant a lot to me, and I won't mention the kid's name, but he's had a pub deal for like the last three years, and he's a good writer, but he's never had that big cut yet, and or, or a single or anything. And um, this album, he called and he's like, I just wanted you to know, I'm just being frank with you, this album saved my pub deal, it, it renegotiated my pub deal, right. and man, like that, really, we we know. We know I what know that what it's like. <laughs> I know what it's like to lose one and not get mm-hmm. that chance. And I also know what it's like to be redeemed and get that chance. And so that just meant a lot to me. That's it really great. it meant a lot to me, especially where I'm at in my career and being on album three and kind of and being established now and having some hits and being in that spot, you know. Um it was a it was a real, real thankful moment. Good for you. We don't even have to go on and on about your song Good Vibes. Yours good a vibe positive person as i've ever met Thanks, so man. it's great it's a it's a big old hit like it ought to be Thank and you. uh and hopefully it lays around for a long time because that's a great message and just you. a good one to surf on Thank you. but i i do have to go back before i let you go and ask one thing that you said earlier that that tweaked my interest a little bit because you were talking about this collaboration and how it takes you a little bit out of your comfort zone so yeah. i've seen you perform enough to know i don't I don't think of you as having a comfort zone. Yeah, that's true. You're you're right. You're You're exactly right. You're a bit of a show off like me, and you you love to hit it and run hard. And and um, and I don't know about you, but I certainly take uh, take my hits that I could care less about from people. It it just worries them that. (laughs) <laughs> and I don't care that I'm oh. having fun, and I hope you ride with me here. But yeah, because, dude, because we're going, brother, brother. <laughs> the biggest thing that scares people is when you don't care. Uh-huh. I have come to find that out. So that's a great point, by the way. <laughs> and I really don't. I mean, like I always tell people, there's about 95 percent of me who really doesn't care what you think, and five percent who still wants that validation because that's just human nature. Yeah, we want validation. We're artists. We're creative people. But we can't help ourselves when we get going. Well, dude, when we're in the we're in the moment. <laughs> Sorry to tell you, but I mean, just look at Keith Urban. He's probably the best guitar player in the world. Oh, yeah. You can't help that, and he can't help that, and why should he help it? My thing is, when I get on stage, I want to be the best, and I don't care who I'm with on stage. I want to—it's competition. I don't 
care how you look at it. Mm -hmm. or There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's total <laughs> competing. That's that's why you've been so successful. That's why so many of us have been successful and so many in our genre and out of genre and everything else. We're supposed to be that way. Otherwise, there wouldn't there wouldn't be country music singers or stars or rock stars or whatever. It would just be singers. I think some people, though, and I'll get off it, you know they got they have more in the tank. You know there's more bullets in the gun. They're holding back and it's that tension is what they bring. Yeah. You know? I've never been able to do that. Me I'm neither. Like, <laughs> That's well, a, you know there's why? all of it, you know. You know why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my biggest thing, man, my biggest thing is is that I think I think personally that in those moments, first of all, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're also not guaranteed walking out of this building today. Yeah. We're not guaranteed life. So you got to be thankful for every single little moment. That's the way I look at it. And every opportunity that you get to shine and be the maybe the the bright star that you wanted to be or that you are or that you're going to be or that you just dreamed of being, every moment you get to do that, you might as well try to be the brightest you can, no matter what. And as long as you do it with a humble heart, which I always do, I know you do, and, and so many of us do, as long as you do it with great humility, you should shine as great as you can. And there's nothing wrong with that. I've always felt that if you're going to get on stage – you have a platform to speak and perform for the masses, you might as well try to be the best and that they remember you because you may only get that shot once and you may not wake up in the morning and you may not get that shot ever again. So um, it's just like when you get a hit song on the radio, you may not ever get another one. So you might as well relish in it as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Enjoy it. And um, that's just sort of how I live my life. And so especially when I'm on stage, and I appreciate the compliment, by the way, again. Yeah. But, but when I'm on stage, man, I don't hold anything back, and I go full force because that's just all I really know. I, I, you know, before I was a songwriter, I was an entertainer, and I, I've always, when you come up playing in bars like we did, and you come up playing because you had to, and because, you know, the only money you're going to make is out of a pickle jar, <laughs> you just have to learn to entertain people, and yeah. you have to learn what they want to hear, and you have to learn what they want to see. And what they want to see is is entertainment value. I think for the most part, especially want to have a little fun for a guy like me. A lot of my show has always come from the entertainment side of it and the entertainment aspect and playing a lot of instruments. And then songs came second. And once I finally aligned the two, it worked and I got <laughs> yeah. hits. You know, yeah. But it took some time. But I I just there's a there's an even balance of that. And I just um, I just loved I always loved traditionally watching people like Hank Jr. Man because he never really he never really gave a crap what people thought on mm -hmm. stage and just kind of did his deal. Jerry Lee Lewis the same way, um, Mick Jagger. I mean like all these people, all the the greats in my opinion. Watching you, man, for instance, when you would play the Gold Top and you play harmonica and things like that's very inspiring because when I see you twisting around doing a doing doing a dance like like I call it a Kicks Brooks dance or a Ricky Medlock <laughs> dance on stage, right? It's kind of like the rain dance, man. It's inspiring and it fires people up. And so, uh, you know, I've always I've always been that way naturally. So I, I think that kindred spirits, birds of a feather, you know, we all understand each other, yeah, even when some people don't, even when some people <laughs> think we're being show offs. It's really just being ourself. And that's yeah, my way of expressing because when I'm off stage, I'm like real quiet. All I want to do is be around my wife and kids and hunt and fish and like <laughs> just smoke cigars on the back porch and not really talk, you know, and do those kind of things. When I'm on stage, it's like Jekyll and Hyde. I'm a totally different person. It's joy, man. It is Share joy. the joy. It's pure joy. And There's it's nothing a, wrong with it. If anybody gives you a hard time about that, tell them to call me. Yeah, I do. I just tell them, I tell them what Good Vibe says. I, say, I literally tell them this. It's true. I say, if you don't have anything good to say, just shut your mouth. And But, you know, the great part is, is when you walk, when you walk with pride, yet you walk with humility, um, usually you don't ever come in conversation with it. You yeah. just do your deal, and I think everything <laughs> shakes out. Thanks for coming yeah. in, man. Great to see you. Pleasure to see you, too. Thank you. <laughs>